It is. All right, everybody, thanks for coming out. We're gonna listen today to Sophie, and she's gonna teach us how to code like an accountant. Uh, we'll not have any Q&A, but please uh, take a chat with her outside if you'd like to uh, discuss more. Let's give her a warm round of applause. Hey, good morning, everybody. I want to talk to you about trust. I want to talk to you about trust because customer trust is the bedrock of successful businesses. It's also what you rely on if you build things that aren't businesses, but we're going to talk mostly about businesses today because we're thinking about accounting. Customers stick with companies they trust, and customers bail on companies they don't trust. So our job as engineers who work for companies is to build products our customers can trust. Most of us are probably back-end engineers, so there's a lot that we can't control when it comes to customers' trust. We can't control their relationships with customer service. We can't control how they feel necessarily about our designs, but we can control two things. We can control and impact how reliable our sites are and how well they perform. If you want to think about that, go read Site Reliability Engineering. It's a really good book. It's freely available on the internet, and it knows a lot more about this topic than I do. The other aspect of trust that we can control as back-end engineers is how our customers feel about how we handle their data. And when customers think about our relationships with their data, we're thinking about two different things. One question customers ask about data is, can I trust you to keep my personal information private? This topic, of course, has been in the news a lot recently. And we're not going to talk about it today, because the second piece of data that our customers care about is how reliable is the data we give them about the business they do on our platforms. They want to know that their order history on Amazon is accurate. They want to know that the payment records in their bank are going to match their payment records on our platforms. And those questions, questions of how to produce accurate, reliable financial records, those are the questions that accountants have been thinking about for 800 years. So I want to talk a little bit about the history of accounting, both because it's interesting and because I think it helps us sort of understand where we are when we are in a field that's only been around for 50. Accounting began, not necessarily really began, but where I want to start with the history of accounting is with a man named Fibonacci. How many of you have heard of him? Yeah, he came up with that famous sequence we saw it in the keynote, the Fibonacci sequence. You can see it on the right-hand side of this page in really, really pretty font. He brought Arabic numerals to Italy. And this was important for two reasons. Before this, Europe had been doing commerce in Roman numerals. Think about that for a second. Nothing but integers, right? And if you have nothing but integers, you can't share profits because you can't divide things into less than an integer amount. So he developed fraction notation in this book called Liber Aci, the Book of Calculation, which he wrote in the 1200s. He also described calculations for profit and loss and described currency conversion rules. And both of those things were things that allowed commerce to flourish and develop in northern Italy over the next 300 years. It facilitated profit sharing and complex business partnerships and allowed multinational trade to flourish. Fast forward a couple hundred years, and a man named Luca Pacioli wrote what is probably the first written algebra book in the vernacular, which is really interesting, called Summa de Arithmetica Gale. And the ninth chapter of this book codified bookkeeping principles. He codified the rules of double entry bookkeeping. He codified ideas of trial balances, balance sheets, all fundamental principles that are still used by accountants today. He also, by the way, wrote down the rule of 72, which is still used by people to approximate logarithms and figure out how to calculate how long it'll take an investment to double. 
But he brought us and codified really important principles and concrete examples for how to do those in business that help business people learn their trade and continue to have business flourish in that time. And the most important principle in my mind that we can learn from accounting is the principle of double entry bookkeeping. What's that principle? The principle of double entry bookkeeping is twofold. We need a complete and immutable record of transaction history that can be externally enforced. Right? That's what accountants do. They produce records of transaction history, and auditors come and look at those records to make sure that they're reliable. The second principle is the principle of double entry. And that is the notion that every entry to an account requires a corresponding and opposite entry to a different account. So if I take my $20 and walk into Barnes & Noble and buy a book, I hand over $20, and I get back a book that probably has a $20 label on the back. Now, we all know that those $20 actually don't represent the full value of the book. The book probably costs less to produce, because if it didn't, Barnes & Noble wouldn't be making any money. Right? So the $20, when I think about the two balancing sides of that equation, the $20 can actually be broken down into the component of that that's Barnes & Noble's profits, plus the component that belongs to the publisher, plus the component that belongs to the author. And there's probably a lot more pieces of that puzzle. But that's the idea of double entry bookkeeping, that every transaction can be described by a set of equal and opposite movements of money where we exchange profits and losses where we exchange credits and debits from both sides of the transaction, because a transaction requires at least two parties. And that's why we should code more like accountants, because accountants have been thinking about how to do data reliably for so many hundreds of years that we must be able to learn something from them. So there's three things I hope you'll learn today. The first is strategies for monitoring data and strategies for using ideas from accounting to monitor your financial data in particular. That's what I'm expert in. I'd love to talk to you about strategies for monitoring non-financial data after the talk. I want to talk about processes for handling incidents when your data goes out of balance, right? And this can happen for all sorts of reasons, which we'll talk about. And the last thing I want to talk about is how to think a little bit more like an auditor when you're thinking about designing your systems. So let's talk about strategies for monitoring data. The rules that catch real incidents most often should be as simple, predictable, and reliable as possible. That's from the Site Reliability Engineering book. Again, its ideas are applicable not only to Site Reliability Engineering, and they're well-written, so I stole their quotes. Let's talk about double-entry bookkeeping. What is this? I keep thinking the slide's going to be over here, and it's not. This equation, the money in equals the money that comes out, right? that's the fundamental equation of double entry bookkeeping. The idea that assets, right? that's the money, the cash value that you have as a company, can really be described as being split into two categories. Revenue, that's the money that belongs to the owners of the company, and liabilities. That's the money that your company owes to external parties. And each transaction can be described in this way. And this is an invariant of your financial system. It should never be false, which means this is a really good monitoring rule because every single transaction, if you fully capture the data that that tra transaction represents, should be describable by this rule. And you can implement it to monitor your system. So let's talk about what that might look like. Here's a simplified Eventbrite ticket data model. This does not represent real data, nor does it fully represent the complexity of our ticket model. So imagine that somebody places a $20 order. They, they issue Eventbrite a $20 payment. Those are Eventbrite's assets at the moment of transaction. Eventbrite has captured those $20. That $20 can be broken into a fee, $2.39, which is the cost of using the platform. Taxes, which Eventbrite collects on behalf of the organizer and remits to the government, and the rest of the money belongs to the organizer who's organizing the event, who will get that money in the form of a payout at a later time. Those numbers should add up. $2 and 239 plus 1 plus 1661 equals $20, yay. Imagine a few weeks later, the organizer partially refunds the ticket, $10. So $10 is returned to the attendee who tried to buy the ticket, 20 cents of that re represents fees. It's a flat fee, so it's not fully refunded proportionally to the cost of the ticket, taxes, and org share. Let's add those numbers up. 
The right-hand side is $9.99. The left-hand side is, one, is $10. That's an imbalanced transaction. That represents either a bug in our pricing algorithm or a problem where we've collected the wrong amount of money. Right? That's a situation that we need to monitor and respond to. The second type of thing that we can do with our data is to check the correctness of the most critical elements of your data using out-of-band data validators, even if API semantics suggest that you need not do so. Again, a quote from Site Reliability Engineering, go read the book. All right, and this is important for two reasons. First of all, it highlights that even when we think we've built perfect systems, we've tested them, we've proven the API correct, we should still, when it comes to critical data, and I'd offer that financial data is always critical data, and financial data includes not only data about the actual money, like your payment system, but also the data about products you sell, because that, those have value and are therefore financial in nature. Those are things that your auditors and your finance people track. So you always want to be checking those, and you want to use out-of-band data validators. And this is, in fact, what accountants have been also doing for hundreds of years. The idea of data reconciliation is core to accounting. And there's two types of reconciliation that I want to offer to you as things you can do in your system that accountants do. The first is item level reconciliation. Item level reconciliation is like taking your personal ledger of your checkbook. How many of you remember balancing a checkbook ever? Yeah, I do. I was 15, but I was really bad at it. That's why I designed financial systems. <laughs> so imagine that you take your checkbook record and compare it to your bank statement. In a perfect system, the transactions will line up on both sides. They will equal one another. So on the right-hand side, imagine that we're missing something that's in our bank statement. That says to me that I'm a terrible keeper of the checkbook. Right? I have missed something that happened, so my record is not reliable. Let's say that something is in my checkbook history but not at the bank. That usually means, hopefully, if my bank is keeping accurate records, that somebody didn't cash their check. But both of those, again, are situations where we have a specific piece of data whose absence we can, who, whose absence we can investigate and fix, right? Again, every time we're monitoring something like this, it becomes a specific situation that we can respond to and hopefully make things right with our customers if we care about their trust. The second type of reconciliation we can do is cash reconciliation. And cash reconciliation is when you, is like cashing out your register at the end of the day. How many of you have ever done that? I've never done it, actually. I didn't work retail. But I'm really glad that some of you have, because you'll probably know what this feels like. You count the money in your register at the end of the day, and you compare it to the sum total of the receipts. If those things don't add up, that means that either somebody is swiping money or there's a problem with the receipts. Again, the issue with cash reconciliation is unlike item level reconciliation, it doesn't tell you where the source of the problem is, but it is a useful tool for sort of looking at a system as a whole and deciding that you need to look into it closer. Right? So if item level reconciliation is too expensive to implement because it costs money and time and computation power to do item level reconciliation for everything that happens in your system, you could consider using cash reconciliation to identify problematic days and then dig into those days with item level reconciliation so you're not necessarily doing item level reconciliation on every transaction. Another thing to think about from accounting is that 100% is probably never the right reliability target. Not only is it impossible to achieve, it's typically more reliability than a services users want or notice. And that's from the embracing risk chapter of the SRE book. Have I, have I like, offered you to read that book enough times. And it turns out that this is a concept in accounting as well. It's a concept called materiality. And materiality is the concept that items are material if they could influence the economic decisions of people who read financial statements. And that's from the generally accepted accounting principles in the US. Here's the thing about materiality. It's context dependent. We produce financial statements for lots of different audiences as companies. And depending on the audience, the level or threshold for any gaps where you're looking at two different reports and they have different amounts is going to be different. Right? And those thresholds are things that you'll need to work out with your business. I can't tell you what the threshold should be. That's going to depend on your legal and accounting departments. 
But the important thing here is that error magnitude, like the magnitude of error that's acceptable, and the judgment of the intention, right, whether we can prove that there's actually malicious intent behind a gap in data, those are what determine how auditors will treat it when they see a gap in your records. Right, the main idea here is that trivial matters are actually to be disregarded even in financial reporting. Now, that's not actually the end of the story when it comes to thinking about ignoring and not keeping complete financial records because your customers are still going to ask you, where's my money? Right? Customers are going to demand perfectly accurate financial reports because if you don't produce them, they will not trust you. So your job is to figure out how to, on the one hand, make sure that you're always good with your customers, but on the other hand, work with your finance team to be producing huge financial reports that they trust that meet their needs. So that covers some strategies for monitoring data. Now let's talk about what happens when your monitoring systems detect data inconsistency. The first and most important thing you can do when it comes to responding for incidents is to be prepared. Don't panic, you aren't alone, and the sky isn't falling. If you feel overwhelmed, pull in more people. Anybody want to guess where that quote is from? <laughs> SRE book, yes, go read it. And when it comes to financial incidents, this is even more important, right? Because we're talking about incidents that are literally about money. It's not just that your site is bleeding money because you can't serve requests, it's that you're literally bleeding money. And when it comes to thinking about who should be on your incident response teams in this case, Obviously, communications, project management, engineering, they're going to be part of the response team. But I want to urge you to also think about your colleagues in finance and customer support. Finance have a really clear view of the overview of what's happening in the company as a whole. And they'll really understand how a particular bug might impact your company's health. Customer support people are the people in your company who know best what customers need and want and how customers are going to react when they find about this problem. And in fact, a customer support person is probably the person who heard from the customers that there is a bug that you're finding out about and triaging and trying to solve as quickly as you possibly can. And the thing about customer support people, particularly if you have customer support folks who focus on financial issues, and we have a lot of them at Eventbrite, and they're fabulous. They know the data better than I do. They know what customers need better than I do. So I want to be allied with them, not only when an incident happens, but every day, because I can ask them questions and they can ask me questions, and it helps us build better products. We also need to build tools to make data management easy. And when I say data management, I mean quite a number of things. I'm thinking about what happens when my payment data and my order data are out of line. What happens when it turns out that there's a whole bunch of payments that I don't know about. How do I build tools to make fixing those data issues possible, right? Because if we're talking about data monitoring, data is what we need to fix. And fixing data is hairy and dangerous because we're usually like literally going in and changing data. And in fact, there's a simultaneous talk that's going on right now by Julie Q about how to edit financial data, uh, how to edit production data, and you should go watch it afterward if you want more concrete technical strategies for doing this. But I'm going to talk about an overview of strategies that you can use and incidents where they might be relevant. What happens when your payment system times out from the payment gateway? So you issue a payment to Braintree, you issue a payment request, and the response is a timeout. To me, that looks like a payment that didn't happen. To Braintree, it turns out the payment did happen. The customer gets a report a month later from their credit card company that they paid $20 for a ticket at Eventbrite that Eventbrite never gave them. They're going to call Eventbrite and say, you charged me wrongly. Now, if I'm smart about my data systems and I do data reconciliation with Braintree's records, I can know about that before the customer does. And then I can go in and correct the data and either give them a ticket if one is available or refund the transaction before they come to me angry that I'm charging them for things they didn't buy. Let's say I'm an airline. How many of you have ever had a flight canceled? The amazing thing about the last flight I was on was, that was canceled was the Southwest flight. I was in Chicago trying to fly to Nashville. It was the winter, so weather canceled my flight. They made an announcement from the gate. We will call you up one by one by name, 
to work with you to get you to your final destination to refund your ticket. And so they called everybody up one by one. There was no angry line of customers trying to yell to see if they could manage to push their way to the front of the line and get a faster route to their destination. None of that happened. And why is it? It's actually probably because there was software that allowed the airline to simultaneously do a whole bunch of things that we probably don't even think happened in the background. They had to rebook passengers across multiple flights. They probably had to transfer money to other airlines to pay for those flights. They had to refund those flights. And that all had to be seamless and possible for the gate agent to do, right? So that's a case where people had anticipated possible problems and built tools for their customer support people to change the data on the fly and make their lives better and make their customers' lives better. Of course, the last kind of situation where your data can get out of line, where you have problems with your financial data, is bugs. Some eight years ago, it came out that Verizon had overcharged 15 million customers for years because of software errors. What was the problem? They were basically charging for incoming data to customers whose plans indicated that for certain interactions, they weren't going to pay for incoming data charges. Most of these amounts, by the way, were between $2 and $6. That's the kind of amount that if you're not looking at your records closely, you wouldn't even notice. But because it affected so many customers, it costed between 30 and $90 million. And it was discovered not because Verizon was keeping good financial records and monitoring the situation and proactively reaching out to their customers to make things right. That's what you should be doing. They were notified because of complaints to the FCC. The, the, the government had to go in and intervene to make things right for these customers. And that's where we don't want to be. We want to be building systems that are resilient, where we can then have tools at our disposal, whether that's by refunding those charges directly, or if for whatever reason we can't refund the charges, we should have financial mechanisms, fundamental financial entities in our systems that allow us to make good with our customers. In the accounting world, we call those charges and credits, and they're really useful tools to have in your, as fundamental entities in your financial system to correct things with your customers. If you want, again, if you want to think more about specific ways that your systems, that your technical systems can do that, go watch Julie's talk afterward. Now let's talk about how to think like an auditor, because auditors are sort of the external viewers of the financial records that we produce, right? that include both of the problems we've identified and their resolutions, and make sure that they are trustable, and they're the government's representatives for doing this. And auditing is a field that's been around as long as accounting. There were laws in the 14th century in Genoa that said that when you were keeping your books, you, had, you couldn't erase anything, and you had to have a witness watch you put a number on the next page of your book to try to make sure that nobody was ever inserting pages after the fact. Auditors are usually thought of as pains in the butt. They demand reams of paper, they come ask annoying questions, and they disrupt your company's life. But the thing is that the questions they ask are really useful. We, some companies even hire auditors to come in and tell them all the questions so that they can understand their risks and expose any holes in their financial systems. So let's think about the questions that auditors ask. They ask, how do you safeguard your financial system? What checks and balances are in place to ensure that your records are accurate, that you're not missing payments, and that your customers should trust you? They'll ask about access controls. Who has access to your servers? Who has access to your databases? Who has access to your admin tools? If you're not locking those things down, then there are people who could intervene and change the data without anybody knowing. And that's a real risk to your company. So you want to think about how you control these things so that on the one hand, everybody can do their jobs, but on the other hand, you're not causing unnecessary risk. Do you have a financial architecture that mitigates risks of data tampering? And I want to talk about a couple specific things here. The first is append-only data stores, right? That's like the merchants of Genoa. You, have to, you cannot erase anything, and you can't add records after the fact, right? So at Eventbrite, we use a double master MySQL configuration for our financial data that never changes anything, right? I know Airbnb uses a Kafka stream with a Spark process that records, again, an append-only record of every event in the financial system, right? We're thinking about log-based storage and not necessarily database storage where you go in and 
when you partially refund an order, change the order's gross from $20 to $10, that is not immutable. That is not a good financial record that you can just hand to your finance, com finance people and they'll be happy. We can talk about automatic backups, right? You want your database to store its snapshots of itself so that if the database goes down, you still have records of it. You want to have a single source of truth for financial data. You want to decide where is the place, what's the data store that you're going to use to source all of your financial records? Because then you can work with accounting to figure out how to structure that. You can work with auditors and say, here is the place, here is the store, this is the place that we need to audit. And everything else emerges from that, rather than having 15 different tables that store financial information, which all need the same level of scrutiny because they're storing financial data. They'll ask you about testing. How do you test changes to your code to ensure stability and accuracy? They'll ask you about data flow. What is the financial life cycle from when a customer comes in and places an order or buys a tool from when they do that through your databases to your financial reports that are produced at the end of the month or the end of the year or whenever your company does that? So this is like a really high level view of how Eventbrite's financial architecture works, but you should be able to describe your company's financial architecture in a sort of similarly both high level and low level approach, because auditors will be surprisingly more technical than you realize. They'll ask you technical questions about your system. Right? So when we receive payments and orders, they all go into our databases, and there's all sorts of ETLs that happen that trans transform that data in so that we can do analysis as a company. But we actually have an accounting specific ETL that takes all of the records in our order and payment system as they come in and translates them into the source of truth for our financial data. And we're currently building this system, so it's not, this isn't, an, this isn't a statement of where we want to be. So those databases power finances records, and ultimately what we're hoping is for that source of truth to also power customer billing, so that when our customers ask us about why they can trust our records, we can say, we're using the same records, we're using these immutable records to also work with accounting, right? We've, we've worked our darndest to make sure that all of our records are accurate and that we can work with them to make sure that they trust that they're accurate as well. Auditors also want to know, can you trace the source and reason for every change to financial data? It's not enough to know what happened, they want to know why. So we store metadata for every transaction, not only describing what happened, but also describing what's the application that produced this transaction. So we can know whether it's a customer-facing application, and this helps us find bugs, by the way, because we know if it happened on mobile or web or whatever. We know what tools produce the changes, and we know what users produce the changes. So that if we ever have any problems with the system, auditors know that we can start to detect potentially fraudulent transactions, that we can start to detect holes in our system because a particular tool isn't behaving correctly. So what I hope you walk away with today is a feeling of empowerment, a feeling of empowerment that you can build metrics and monitoring around data, that you can recover when a data incident happens, and that you can make audits something that are useful and a learning tool rather than something that is a pain. And the reason I want to empower you is because thinking about financial engineering is scary. A lot of people I know are like, I would never work on a financial engineering team. The risk is too high. I'd be too scared of messing up. But the reality is, is that if we build good systems, it, the fear doesn't need to be on the individual developer. If you ever want to learn more about accounting, there's a number of articles on the internet that you can read and a number of books that are really interesting if you found the history of accounting piece interesting that I've been reading. Um, I, Martin Kleppman's book is really, article is interesting because it describes accounting. I'll tweet these out. My Twitter, if you look at it, is only for tweeting out links from conference talks. I don't actually use it for anything else, but I'll tweet these out. Um, accounting for Computer Scientists describes the ideas of double entry bookkeeping in the language of graph theory, which is really compelling and powerful as a language for thinking about something that is often confusing, in part because the language of debits and credits that accountants use came around before a complete understanding of negative numbers. And so it seems overly complicated, and I think Kleppman does a really good job of translating that language into one that we as computer scientists and math-oriented people can understand. I just wanted to thank my Eventbrite teammates who've been thinking about these questions with me for years, in particular my colleague Sarah Galifant, 
who's the our revenue accountant who worked with us to build the system and like answers all of my questions about accounting all day, every day, all the time. She's amazing. I wanted to thank the Recurse Center community. Um, I went to the Recurse Center about three years ago and the people in the community have been helping me work on my talk and helping with my talk proposal and all these things. If you want to talk more about the Recurse Center community, there's an open space to ask questions about it. It's a place you can spend three months to be a better programmer or a week. It's amazing, you can talk to me or about it or go to the open space. I also want to thank my spouse and child for giving me away for a weekend on Mother's Day to come here and talk to you and also for all of the hours that I've been ignoring them to work on this talk. Uh, thank you so much, it's been such a pleasure.